Hey, it's Karen Kella. And we're back with another episode of the Boozy Biddies. This is the Drink As You Learn School with two longtime friends. And sometimes we're just two boozy biddies. If you're tired hearing about wines you can't afford, don't worry. Yeah, because today we're talking about whiskeys you can't afford. Grab a glass of something rare and expensive and join us. So yes, this is coming off the heels of our cult wines, domestic international episodes, and then our chat with Natalie McLean, and we've talked about some cult wines there too, briefly. So uh, lots of, uh, you know, some $23,000 plus bottles of wine, and now we're going to jump into the whiskeys that cost thousands of dollars a bottle. Well, I can kick it off, kick, uh, there we go, kick it off <laughs> with Pappy Van Winkle, which is a bourbon produced by Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace Distillery seems like they just make a crap ton of good bourbons. They own so much. You know, I think it's like almost merits an episode on them one day, like a distillery spotlight, because they have such a unique story and they do own quite a bit. And I think Pappy Van Winkle is one. If you like whiskey, it just even casually, you've definitely heard of Pappy Van Winkle before. Yeah, I actually was um, talking with someone not too long ago about favorite whiskeys. And she had just tried um, Whistle Pig's Boss Hog, which is yes. a pricey one. And she's like, yet to try the Pappy Van Winkle. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've had that, which I may have. But that said, I think it just like was a knee jerk reaction because it's I was like, I know that name. And now I'm like reflecting on it. I was like, maybe I have like maybe my dad has had it at the house on occasion. I was gifted a bottle once and I had it. It was like this is years ago. This is like multiple boyfriends ago, um, <laughs> you know, like the, the, how, we me- how we measure time, <laughs> multiple of Cal's men before, before this instance. And I had a bottle and I, I was out of town and the guy was at my apartment and he drank it. He didn't realize what it was. And he was mixing it. I was like, well, at least I hope you enjoyed it. He was like, yeah, it tasted really good with Coca-Cola. And I was like, you were fucking mixing it with Coca-Cola? Because <laughs> it wasn't one of like, it was one of the, I think it was one of the rise or something like that. It was, you know, I think it retailed for 700, 800 bucks or something like that. And that's not when you broke up with him? <laughs> uh, no, I said just had to give him many more chances for some reason. <laughs> Yours oh, worth a, of chances. That's, that's a, that's a strikes one too, at least. Um, yeah, so... You can find some bottles if you're lucky to stumble across, like occasionally in liquor store, you can find some bottles. They have ones that are aged in different amounts of years. So some of their ones that are like minimum of 10 years versus their 23 year age bottlings. You can find at something approaching affordable prices. I think I saw some can go for like 350, but like hard to find. But some of their more aged ones and especially certain like releases of their aged ones can go for like fifty thousand to sixty thousand dollars a bottle. I think it was especially the ones too that the actual like distiller who has the name made are the really ultra right. rare. Ones. So we'll get yeah. into the, the history a little bit. So the name comes from the original whiskey maker who was Julian P. Peppy Van Winkle Sr. He was a very steadfast bourbon maker, and he had like his mantra was, we make fine bourbon at a profit if we can, at a loss if we must, but we always make fine bourbon. So like quality over everything. And he started out as a traveling salesman for a a different bourbon producer, W.L. Weller and Sons. And then he and one of the other salesmen ended up buying that company in 1915. They also relaunched the company Stitzel Weller, and they became known for their weeded bourbon recipe. And they used more wheat and rye instead of the mash bill for a smoother taste. Um, That said, Pappy Van Winkle, the label, they do have both a rye and a whiskey. But I guess the part of the thing with it is their mash bill is just super tasty and very likable because it's that traditional sort of 51% corn is the minimum, but a weeded bourbon mash bill. I'm guessing, I guess I haven't compared many mash bills, but I guess it's very appealing to most palates. That's sort of why it became... Very likable, but just quality over everything. Pappy himself became, was involved with the production until he died in 1965 at the age of 91. Anthony Bourdain was a big fan. In one of his TV shows, he said, if God made bourbon, this is what he'd make. And then there was also a 2013 Netflix doc called The Heist, um, about f- about $500,000 worth of bourbon that was stolen from the Buffalo Trace Distillery. And that sort of only made Pappy Van Winkle more popular. But that said, it was like on a slow rise, like the early 2000s was it was just it getting more and more recognition and being more and more sought after. They do only release a certain number, like it's limited release. And then again, because most bourbons are aged for, you know, 
three, four years. Their minimum age is 10 years and they have some that age for 23 years. So it just makes them extra special. I've noticed that, I mean, when they go to the market, so with this Buffalo Trace, this company that you were saying that owns like a million things, like they also produce Eagle Rare and George T. Stagg and Blanton's um, for some of their higher end whiskeys, but you have to like get an allocation from them if you're a retailer or a restaurant. You have to purchase like so much of their other things in order to qualify to be able to purchase a bottle of Pappy. So it's not just like, and I remember learning this, it is like dumb cheap i think to purchase pappy as a retailer i think like the cost to them is like a 100 bucks and then they mark it up like crazy but it's just the demand yeah and then so if you're lucky enough to stumble into i guess one of those liquor stores that has the allocation you can find some bottles depending on you know the aging of it for an affordable price but then i guess it's just so popular there's such a secondary market for it that like then it goes to auction it sells um super high like there are 23 year age whiskey like regularly auctions for around fifty thousand dollars, sometimes more, a bottle. And then there is one, the old Rip Van Winkle, their twenty-five year old aged bottle, the one that was bottled in nineteen eighty nine, that one sold at auction for sixty five thousand, which I think is the highest on record. Jesus so. Christ. <laughs> Again we get into this sort of like, I don't know. These are investor items. You're not necessarily drinking them and so a little bit of the the why. Why? <laughs> yeah. There's a couple s- stores near me that when they get their allocations, they do a lottery to be able to purchase the bottle. I've entered my name every year, every time I see my answer, my name in the thing. But then I'm like, if I like, it's just like the right to purchase the bottle. It's not like, hey, you get a free bottle of Pappies. And so I'm like, if I win, I'm like, they're like, that'll be $800. I'm like, no, JK, JK, JK. <laughs> I don't like, know. What, I'll, I'll pass this year. Yeah, I have no idea what they're meaning to actually pay you for. I've never been picked. I'll try so. again. Yeah. So Buffalo Trace acquired the Pappy Van Winkle label ages ago, but they do still produce it in partnership with the Van Winkle family. And I guess together they spent, this was so, you know, an older article, I'm sure it's still ongoing, but I guess as it became more popular in the early 2000s, counterfeiting became an issue. People are counterfeiting it for sale in secondary markets. And so they spent $500,000 between October, 2016 and October, 2017 to stop online sales of counterfeit Pappy. So that's a, a lot of money. And there I did see because Buffalo Trace has so many, you know, so many of these high end labels. They also have obviously like Buffalo Trace, just their entry level bourbon is obviously affordable. Eagle Rare, you can find some affordable ones, but they do have so that initial company that Pappy Van Winkle bought that he had worked for, W. L. Weller. I guess they do make a William Larue Weller Kentucky Straight Bourbon, which supposedly uses the exact same mash bill as the Pappy Van Winkle. It's still expensive, but you can get one for a few thousand. Oh, good. <laughs> good, good, good. Maybe someone will gift you that one next, and your next boyfriend can drink that one with Coca-Cola. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Want to talk about some more whiskey we can't afford? Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> right. and, and even harder to find, probably, because it's this one's Japanese. <laughs> yes, Karizawa Japanese whiskey is going to be the one that I start chatting about now. So Japanese whiskey in general has been a very explosive category recently. I think people are realizing just how good Japanese whiskey is. So we're seeing more and more of it. But maybe that has also contributed to how popular this one is. But this whiskey was distilled near a snow-capped active volcano called Mount Osama in Japan, which sounds very, very romantic. When I was first reading the article, I was like, wait, do they not make it anymore because the volcano exploded? <laughs> so I was like kind of hoping for that in the story. Not really, because that means lots of people it's died. super rare now. Yes. <laughs> but um, essentially, it's located on the southern slopes of that volcano, and that is one of Japan's most active volcanoes. It's a category A volcano, I guess. But that volcanic climate that they're in, it creates these really cold, snowy winters, and the summers are up to like 80% humidity. So that's been specific atmospheric condition there is like very ideal for whiskey maturation. So Kaizawa is like a popular resort town in this area, and it was a big p- place for people from Tokyo to go vacation. So the original distillery was built there in 1956, and it produced sherry cask matured whiskey that was mostly used to make blends. The first vintage was released in 1971. So 1956, 1971, they're operating without a profit. <laughs> 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 That's, you know, what I'm what I'm understanding here. 
So, but they prided themselves on tradition and they imported golden barley from Scotland and they imported sherry cast from Spain. So they're using like high quality, like traditional that like in 1958, I guess the restrictions became really relaxed. So they were getting like the highest quality barley they could get, including one called Golden Promise, which is what McCallan used at the time. They're really going for quality. Really going for quality. Lots of overhead expenses and and maybe no profit. That's the downfall of them, to be honest with you. I don't think that's why they didn't do it so well. Because uh, then they also had like the volcanic, like the water flowed through the lava rocks. So it's got this like interesting taste. And like it wasn't really super, super popular. Maybe in the 1980s, it started making some single malts. And that's when like Japanese, the Japanese people started to enjoy it more like the reputation grew in the home country for this whiskey but not like much further outside of that so with all of these like high-end things the quality everything it kind of became their undoing and it became like commercially unsustainable for them to use traditional methods and the very best ingredients and so they stopped producing in 2001 oh so this is like a this is actually like not just an expensive whiskey, it's a rare whiskey. Like yes. You, you can't get it. <laughs> no. Really. So they shut down production in two thousand one and then in two thousand six, Kieran, who does like I think they're like the owners of that soy sauce brand and stuff like that too. Like they're a big drinks company. They acquire the license and then in like later in two thousand eleven they tried to there's like hopes of reopening the distillery and returning, but it just ended up not happening. And then in two thousand sixteen they just like raised the distillery, like just just took it took it all down. So the building's gone. But I guess what happened when they closed and stopped producing, they did have casks of single malt scotch style whiskey left. And so this bottler called number one drinks it's an independent company bought all the rest of the single casks that they had and started to for how much i wonder i know i didn't find making a killing i didn't find that out but they started to bottle them and sell them and they started being imported to the european market and it like the drinkers in europe were just like holy fuck this whiskey so good (laughs) like how do we not know about it oh wait they don't make it anymore fuck (laughs) no we gotta buy it at extreme prices yeah so the original stock was acquired by these private parties and like sold at like extremely high prices and then like in march 2020 a bottle of 52 year old became the most expensive japanese whiskey sold at auction and it was 363,000 pounds is that just the most expensive Japanese whiskey or the most expensive whiskey? I mean, geez, Louise. I know. What is what is pounds to U.S. dollars? Pounds is stronger than the dollar. That could be like... So that's about 455000 U.S. dollars is what this one bottle went for. And it, part of it was it was one of only 41 bottles in existence that had this like... It was called the 52-year-old cask number 5627 Zodiac Rack. Zodiac Rat, 1960. <laughs> Zodiac Rack. <laughs> <laughs> That's my tits, actually. <laughs> it's the nickname for my tits. It's a Zodiac Rack since I'm a witch. <laughs> Perfect. So, so they just crazy. And then a, like a 250 milliliter bottle in 2020, a smaller size bottle that was a 47 year old whiskey, sold for 160 thousand US dollars. So, I mean, if you do want to try this whiskey and you don't have the budget. Well, guess what? They're reopening. So <laughs> I don't. They, they figure there's, there's a strong market for their whiskey now, yep. so they're like, "We'll try it again." So I guess this is why I got confused by this. But Karuzawa Distillery is coming. Distillery is coming back to life by the launch of a company called Karuzawa Distillers, and they're hoping to bring back this idea of whiskey. But it's going to be called Komoro Distillery. Hmm. Maybe they can't, maybe because of a branding thing or a marketing or a copyright or a thing. Who knows? So someone's dumping some money into it. And it's, this is, I mean, this, I think, was announced in 2022. So this information should be like this. I'm assuming they're working on it right now. So maybe there will be a chance to try this famous Scotch style single malt whiskey from Japan. Well, hopefully they release their first bottles faster than uh, (laughs) the original company. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, maybe, hopefully they figured out how to work with profit here <laughs> go to market faster <laughs> well mccallan's our next one yeah and so i didn't mccallan is a really well-known brand you can find mccallan you know everywhere they have more affordable yeah, there's quite a range here and i guess this answers our question as to whether or not that was the most expensive japanese 
or all whiskeys, because this is definitely more expensive, the prices we're going to talk about now. I just brought up the history real quick. It's a single malt scotch whiskey distillery from, I'm not even going to try to pronounce the town in Scotland it's from, because Karen and I couldn't even pronounce Isla, is it, right? Is it, is it from Islay? No, it's definitely it's from Moray, <laughs> which I'm probably saying wrong as well. Uh, Mora, Scotland, I don't know, M-O-R-A-Y, Scotland. It's like the regular Macallan scotch whiskey is one of the top five best-selling single malt whiskeys in the world. Um, it was founded in 1824, and it was one of the first distillers in Scotland that had a legal license for manufacturing and selling alcohol, and now it's grown to be one of the largest in the world. It was founded by this guy named Alexander Reed, who was a barley farmer and a teacher. When the barley was done being harvested and there's winter, there's no active farming, he was fermenting and distilling it into whiskey. So that's kind of like the background there. They're still producing. You can find them in a whole range of prices and styles and whatnot. But what I found fascinating was that it really takes the cake for some of like the most expensive brands in the world. Like their core range starts at 100, but like it's more affordable. Right. So I have had McAllen, but definitely not some of these bottles we're going to talk about. Jeez Louise. They say there's six reasons why it's so expensive in general, just even like the starter range. It's made from the very best barley grains in the world. It's distilled in small pot stills versus columns. It's from a very finely cut distillate. So we talked about distillates in the distillation episode a million years ago. And we've talked about how there's heads, hearts, and tails. And the hearts is like the best of the the liquid. The heads will make you go blind. The tails just don't taste so good. But they like really narrow down the hearts. So there's just not a lot. So they keep just like a very small portion of all of the distillate. And that's matured in very high quality cast that costs money. The color is 100% natural. There's no additives there, which is great. And then they're just really well branded and marketed. So that kind of makes them really expensive. But one of the ones, the McAllen 1926, which is a 60 year old bottle, sold for $2.3 million. <laughs> I just still don't understand what you do with that bottle then. Do you just like put it in your safe? I have this bottle. <laughs> and here's where like their well branded and marketing thing comes into expensive. Like all of these three wines or whiskeys that we're going to talk about have something unique to all of them and it's their bottle. So this was distilled in 1926, this this whiskey, and it sat in ex sherry casks in Scotland for 60 years until 1986 when it was bottled. The bottle was hand painted by renowned Irish artist Michael Dillon and he had never like this is the only bottles he had ever painted. So like just also an art collector's item on top of this, but there's only 24 bottles. Okay, so that's, yeah, making it very limited. They're really going for cult here, but still, I don't know what you do with this. Like, do you just, like, keep it in a safe and, like, whisper to people about how you have this expensive whiskey? the nice thing, at least, is, like, once you open whiskey, like, it doesn't go bad. Like, you could theoretically, like, just, like, have a sip. Have a sip. Have a sip (laughs) and then, like, hold the rest of it. I don't know. But then the next one, the McAllen Valerio Adami, which is also a 1926, that sold for $1.7 million at Bonham's Whiskey Sale in Edinburgh, Scotland in 2018. Again, another artist label. So they really play on this artist stuff, huh? Yep. The bottle was designed and crafted by artist Valerio Adami. It was a limited edition. Again, only 24 bottles. And only 12 of them, I guess, had Valerio Adami's name on them. Like, if those were the only ones he, I don't know. He signed, so those ones were extra expensive. <laughs> yes. So they were bottled again in 1926 and came out six years later 1986 so apparently this year was very expensive <laughs> i just like it's so interesting though that because they're aged for so long that's just going into the company because if you're somebody who's working on that 1926 vintage i guess that you're putting into the cast so, yeah like by the time this sells for millions of dollars yeah yep you're posthumously famous now i guess <laughs> <laughs> And then the McAllen M. I remember hearing about this one. This one was a little bit more affordable. Only sold for $964,000. It's under a million. (laughs) Just under a cool mill. So this hand-blown decanter created as much value as the whiskey did. So they're realizing that these like rare collector's items are like in this branding. It started to become part of it. So it took 17 craftsmen over 50 hours to complete the final bottle, one bottle, just one glass bottle. And they were called Constantine bottles, and only four of them were made. But this one, the whiskey in here is older. I mean, it's not a specific vintage or anything. The whiskey that was in the bottles was between 25 and 75 years old. So this is just like really just kind of showcasing like make it really difficult to buy. 
And also difficult to counterfeit because this bottle. Like, how are you going to counterfeit that? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's obviously still going to be high quality because McAllen does only high quality. But it's. I feel like it's the bottle that's commanding more of the price than what is actually inside of it because if there's only four of them and it took all this time to make it that's where like this like marketing department thing really like excels and helps create this expense that's added to it I wonder who comes up with these things they sit in a room they're like this is how we're gonna make this bottle we gotta commission this glass blower and we gotta- <laughs> so this it's just fascinating to me so i mean there's plenty of other mccallans that have gone to market and commanded such high prices but i mean that could be its own fucking episode to be honest with you cool beans Whiskies that we will never drink. I mean, Pappy Van Winkle is like, you can buy it at bars, but it's going to cost you like $80, $90 for a pour of it. Right. I've done that before, too. I think I bought it for a different partner (laughs) years ago, (laughs) many boyfriends ago. I think for his birthday, we went out and I bought him like one of them. Yeah, so that that I get. I'm so I'm still confused. We're gonna have to find one of these people and have them on the podcast so they can tell us what they do with their million dollar bottle of McAllen. <laughs> I know. Just, hey, if you're out there, if you're a boozy, boozy, boozy bitties <laughs> listener and you drink really expensive shit, come on our podcast. <laughs> T- talk to us about it. You don't have to share. We wouldn't mind. We it. could do it anonymously. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no one's coming after your house and your goods, but like, you know, send us a sample bottle of something. Like, we'd be pretty down. Alrighty. Well, there we go. And uh, in this vein, at least it's stuff you can drink, but next week we'll be sharing some uh, U.S., well, not U.S., but alcohol brands that are older than the United States. Yes, in honor of 4th of July. Yep. There was more to the world before America was founded. I know some people have a hard time believing that America isn't everything all of the time, but, you know. There was alcohol around before us. There was before us. We did not invent the wheel. (laughs) Yep. All right. Double Double fist fist yourselves. yourselves.